I'm going to hand you over to Archbishop Jackson, and I hope we'll have a, a good discussion. I suppose coming up to um, the virtual close down of our society, I had a fun. Um, I think people very quickly realized that <clears throat> compliance um, was very important, and so many people went with that. The idea of gal and so what had to happen with us and with other faith communities was that we had to move from tangible to virtual. And I hope that in doing that, we didn't lose uh, the power and the importance of the symbolical. But I would also say that it has been a tremendously theological time in which to live. Because of our confined circumstances, because of our reduced opportunities, there's been a tremendous opportunity to dig deep into the content and the core of our faith around things that we took for granted and didn't really bother with because they were always there and you could do them today, you might have done them yesterday. Secondly, I think a way of digging together to find values in common. Bereavement and trauma, I think, are one of the things that are devastating for people now. Another thing that we don't see is the density of domestic abuse because the wrong people in many ways are behind the closed doors. Uh, the impact on desocializing children uh, is something, again, we haven't really worked out. The cap but it's uh, very difficult. Behind all of this, there is, I think, I wouldn't use the word collapse, I'd probably use the word of virtual disintegration of an economy. And I don't mean to be negative or depressing at all, uh, we found a lot of riches and uh, wealth within this. But at the same time, there is a problem, which is the slamming on of the brakes and the gradual releasing of the engine again to move is going to cause us problems. So that's just a brief outline from my own perspective, and I hope it reflects something of the experience of people in other faith contexts. It's a great delight for me to engage with people from Finland because Finland is well known to me um, through my work with Porvo, and I co-chair the Porvo Communion with Matti Repo, the Bishop of Tampere. Thank you. Our first reaction to these exceptional circumstances was to strengthen our mutual communication, both internal and external. And here are some examples of what we have done in practice. So various authorities, such as governmental ministries and healthcare institutions, have asked us to share information with religious societies in many different languages. For example, Russia, Arabic, Somali, Afghan, Estonian, Chinese. And that was because of the strong trust the authorities have in religious leaders knowing that their community members, in particular, in particular immigrants, listen to them attentively and with respect. The governmental authorities wanted to collect information about the mental endurance of people in Finland during the coronavirus crisis using a survey. And we delivered the survey to our member communities and collected data for the authorities. Uh, religious leaders had an immediate connection with each other and thus were able to make a common statement to comfort and encourage their people in the unsettling, uncertain situation. We also wrote articles to the media dealing with the practices in various religious communities. Some of these the media published also. We were invited to be one of the partners in the Finland Acts Together campaign launched by Prime Minister's office. And we also, we have also had active cooperation with other NGOs in the same field. Regarding the re restrictions in practice in one's religion because of the pandemic, as far as I know, all the Finnish religious communities have made, us, made use of online possibilities, given 
spiritual and material help to people in need and have had meetings, services and events online. This exceptional time has really shown the power of interfaith dialogue and cooperation. In a crisis, we can realize how similar we all really are as human beings, regardless our, of our different religions. Such cooperation is an active and influential way to build peace. Um, we acted very um, quickly. Uh, our, our last meeting, I think, was March the 11th, and at that stage we were already uh, discussing what we should do, how we should support people. And our first, our fir the first thing that we did was we, we published a statement saying that we spoke in unity and asking of all people of faith and none to come together in support and solidarity. We have on, on the Dublin City Faith Inter Forum Baha'i, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christ, Muslim, Jewish, and Sikh representatives. We speak with one voice, uh, calling on all, our, all of the citizens to offer care and support for one another in the days ahead. Our synagogue here in Dublin, the synagogues closed on the 5th of March, so we were fairly quick off the mark. We responded very well to uh, the government and healthcare uh, directives. Everybody, of course, was terribly shocked. But um, we have responded well. And the faith communities are very important ac actors in the current crisis. And we have engaged uh, with all sorts of levels. We, we have engaged uh, very well with the HSE chaplaincy program and um, end of life care and, and so on and everybody has contributed so the chaplains and hospitals can can work and in, indeed in prisons can work with uh, can, uh, the patients there when when we can't go in to to do the necessary uh, from the from the um, Jewish perspective similar to Finland we have a very small uh, community uh, maybe 12 or 1500 um, in response we have we've had all of our services or most of our services uh, online uh, with the Orthodox unfortunately they can't have services on Shabbat online but all, all the others uh, there are prayers every every morning and evening but, um, Every evening, the Jewish community have um, very interesting speakers online. Uh, and in fact, at our services, we see more people than we would normally see in synagogue because for, for older people, it's been, it's been absolutely wonderful because they are able to, to attend all of the services regularly and, and really appreciate uh, this event, the, these events. Uh, I was, you know, we, we, we reach out, we try to help wherever we can. We're very concerned about children, young people, uh, and how they're being catered for. It, 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 it's so difficult. We did get together with the School of Religion in Trinity College, uh, the Dublin City Interfaith Forum, and we, we did a, a little um, presentation called Together in Hope, which has gone down. Uh, very has been very well received. Um, <laughs> thank you. So I talked to some students during the week. Um, I spent time with two students yesterday, one a Christian and one a Muslim, and says, what is the pain at the moment that's going on in this COVID-19 pandemic for you and for us generally? And we identified six pains. Firstly, the pain of isolation. Secondly, the pain of disconnection. Thirdly, the pain of pain and suffering. Fourthly, the pain of anarchy. Fifthly, the pain of death. And 
Lastly, the pain of diminishment. So when you look at these six pains, you begin to say, how do you work in this? The pain of isolation is very real. The loss of human contact, of hugs and handshakes, grandparents standing in doorways, resisting their instincts to hold and hug. We see a space that in normal circumstances wouldn't be there. And then there's the pain of disconnection. I suppose the university hasn't really fully realized how much education is about connection. It's not about engagement with solitary laptops. Students are suffering because they're not buzzing with others. The banter of the class, the study groups, all underline that education is about connection that leads to belonging. And that fosters real learning, growth and maturation. I could go on on all these six points, but I, I want to I maybe just focus on, on one more. The fourth pain, the pain of anarchy, and it's seen in some countries rather than others. It's the painful comment from people that don't care about others. Their individual rights are more important than the needs of the community. And this can be done, I suppose, when people protest out loud or quietly, when they just do what they want to do, disregard norms. I suppose the task of faith groups is to remind us that we are communities, that we work alongside one another. Iftar is diminished now because we do not meet people. And the light of religious leaders and communities needs to con constantly remind people what we miss is what we're missing is telling us what is necessary. Its absence is reinforcing what needs to be present to make us fully human. And the pain of diminishment, just to fit shortly with that, that's an interesting thing that's happening in students' life. And the opposite to diminishment is progression. I'm worried that I won't get to next year. I'm worried that I won't get to secondary school. I'm worried that I won't get a job. And as a church, ringing, and as a chaplaincy, ringing people and saying, I want you to do something in second year and next year, has proven to be a lifeline, a reminder that they're not going to be diminished, they're going to progress. And we, we have to give that hope. Like other churches and religions, we have a role in advancing the psychological resilience in Finland. Let me give you some examples what the Finnish Church, uh, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church, has done now in, in this crisis situation. Uh, 120 pastors work in, in Finnish hospitals in, in normal times also. They support nursing staff, patients and their family members. And in, in this crisis, uh, it's natural that, that the importance of this work is even bigger than in, in normal times. Church also offers conversational support in, in telephone, via internet and chat. Uh, 50,000 telephone conference, uh, conversations per year, but the statistics don't tell us yet if there has been growth during this crisis. We, have, we also um, offer church family counseling, uh, 18,500 clients per year, and now in this epidemic situation, um, counselors um, are now encountering the clients digitally. And the, the need for this work will increase during the crisis and, and after that also. also. Well, uh, deacons work, work uh, deaconal workers work all over Finland with volunteers, organizations, and municipalities, even in crisis. And special emphasis now is placed on work to find people, and especially to find those who were at risk of being, being ignored even before the, the corona crisis. In many parishes, Everyone over the, uh, the age of 75 or 80 has been phoned to find out if they are right and to ask what kind of help they would need. For example, in Helsinki and in Oulu, um, this has been done in cooperation with the city municipalities. Many parishes share food, grocery bags that are filled with waste food given by the local food shops and those of the Paris workers who could not continue their own work due to the corona situation work in, in food co uh, coordination centers at the moment. 
And all over the Finland parishes and their volunteers have been innovative and active, inventing different ways to help and support those who are in, in quarantine, those who have the big, biggest pain, those pains that you, Alan, Alan just described. Um, so many kinds of helping groups have been organized in, in parishes with volunteers. Uh, and then, since uh, services, masses and services cannot be conducted in the normal way at the moment, most parishes are streaming uh, video and audio worship in their own websites and social media channels. And this is something that I must say that as a communicator, I, I, I can say that I'm very proud of. Uh, there have been tens of services every every Sunday available in the web, so that's that's quite amazing. Youth clubs, um, musical play schools for the toddlers, Bible study uh, groups, etc., have has been have been organized via Zoom, Teams, Instagram, etc. In Finland, the national broadcasting company YLE broadcasts devotions and worships produced by church communications on radio, TV and internet. Compared with the corresponding period in normal circumstances, there has been a significant increase in both television and radio audiences for worship and, and devotions. Well, then the power of social media and traditional media is, is strong, also in crisis. And our task as Christian communications is to, I think, first of all, is to send people hope and, and minimize their, those pains Alan described. Our communications. And one strange thing is that, that we keep having feedback that why the church is so silent, silent, why the bishops are silent. I'm just wondering, is it possible to get our message more visible in this complicated media, media world at the moment? That's what we try to do, but it's, it's not easy. Eva, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Your Grace. I'll try to be short. Um, first, I, I, I think I need to say that the Anglican Church in Finland is very small. So, so this is uh, a view from a very small place in a society. Um, first, I would like to say something about being part of the diocese in Europe. Uh, when the situation in Southern Europe was worsening fast at the beginning of this year, Finland was still uh, in relatively safe and, and quiet um, uh, phase of the pandemic. Uh, church services, other functions and societal life continued as normal, though concerns were raising um, all the time uh, and increasingly. Eventually we were, I'm quite confident to say, one of the first churches who introduced measures uh, to make the church a more better pre prepared to prevent possible contamination uh, during the service. This was possible due to the structure and shape of the diocese. Experience and guidelines in the southern parts made it possible for the diocese in office to introduce guidelines which were put in place in the whole uh, geographical area. For this reason, uh, we had already cancelled meetings and gatherings and taking new measures uh, into use, uh, for example, when administering the Eucharist, before the society at large and the government in Finland acted. The same is visible now when the government and religious organizations are making plans to come out from the heavy restrictions, though some restrictions will uh, still remain. We already have a plan what we shall do when we can start to look into the new normal. Briefly about pastor and religious life, all activities have been moved to online, as mentioned earlier, and we have created new ways to contact the members of our community. Um, and I'm 
very great, uh, grateful to the Archbishop to mention the theology and, and the opportunities for new theology, which I'm sure will emerge uh, from our experiences and reality. We are a small entity. So it is very difficult for us to offer any diaconal ministry, meaningful diaconal ministry, uh, to outside of our church community at the time like this. On the other hand, we must remember that Finnish society uh, has not experienced a total lockdown. In theory, it would have been possible for us to continue services from the church with a very limited, limited number of people, but we have chose not to do so. This was to avoid confusion, but also to comply with the government's wishes and the practice of our host church, the Lutheran Church in Finland. We are also very blessed to live in a society which has very good structures to respond to, emer to emer emergencies like COVID-19. The main duty for us has been to give pastoral support, to disseminate right information and to make sure that people have the services and help they need. Our online ministry has been a vital source for, of, for pastoral care and support for many non-Finnish speaking persons, not only in Finland but globally. The language used during this uh, pandemic has revealed to at least to us that the government has had difficulties to recognize the variety of religions and churches in Finland. It is interesting that it's been noted that the virus spreads more effectively in immigrant communities. Still, the most visible communication nationwide has been only Finnish and in Swedish by clearly Finnish persons. But can we and should we recognize the variety of people in our society? And I think here the religious uh, communities has uh, had a key role to play. And then very briefly, religious communities are global communities. We should take seriously our responsibility and also our capability to communicate global threats. And of course, also the things to praise, uh, 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 which we can give praise to our host societies. We should also keep in mind that in online world, we are not speaking only to our own nations, but to the global audience, which might have the significance and significant impact we all need. Thank you. Um, I first of all would like to say I really, really have valued this opportunity for us to do this. And the enforced circumstances of doing it this way uh, we're probably finding our way, but I think we've got enough out of it and given enough through it for me to make a tentative request, which is that we might meet again and that it might be hosted in and from Helsinki. A secular state is lost without the connectivity that is given through faith and religion. It has spent a lot of its time probably arguing with and arguing against it, but the sort of things that we heard in our early speeches today show that we are integral to the fabric of this society, particularly in a post-secular and a post-modern world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think we ought not to be ashamed of our contribution, but ought to be able to celebrate it in the context. So perhaps faith as well as um, creation are on the move. I'd certainly like to hope so. The thing that we might do is simply in our own silence and from our own heart, and uh, from our own traditions to pray for one another and for those who are in need, and then we can conclude. Almighty and all loving God, hear our prayer. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for a very stimulating morning. And um, I look forward to a return match uh, hosted in uh, Finland. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.